Fortescue is the world's fourth biggest producer of iron ore, a critical material for the manufacture of steel. And they're on the big mission to decarbonise by 2030. But that is a huge challenge. We're talking big mines, big machinery, big, 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 big challenge. So they've enlisted the help of Fortescue WAE, previously Williams Advanced Engineering, born out of Williams F1 team. And together, they've pioneered an electric 221 tonne mining truck. So today we're finding out a little bit more and finding out what on earth any of that has to do with motorsport. Like everything electric, you'll love our fun-packed Everything Electric Expos around the world. Come and join us in Harrogate, Farnborough and Vancouver. Remember, energy and transport professionals go for free. Fortescue's Iron Mine is in Western Australia, where the Roadrunner electric truck prototype is currently operating. And we're not in Western Australia. We're a little outside of Oxford at the Fortescue WAE Technical Innovation Centre. Now, why have those two organisations come together? And does that seem like an obvious partnership? Well, with WAE's history steeped in motorsport, where there are extreme conditions, rapid development times, extremely complex engineering challenges, they've been able to apply those principles to a range of everyday complex engineering challenges, such as using 100% recycled blades, borrowing techniques from the world of aerodynamics to make supermarkets a little bit warmer for shoppers and a little bit cooler for the food. And now they're turning their attention to mining trucks. And here at the Technical Innovation Centre, this is where the batteries are built. So lots of people watching this video will be familiar with WAE in its various different guises because of its relationship to motorsport. What they might be less familiar with is the mining sector. Mm. Talk to us about that relationship with Fortescue. So, uh, so WAE was Fortescue's latest acquisition. So the, we, we were purchased around uh, two years ago by the Fortescue Group and uh, who have a huge ambition to become uh, real zero in scope one and scope two for all of their operations by 2030. That's decades ahead of the regulations and of the rest of their industry. Um, so we are here to provide the technology solution and manufacturing to make all of their mobile equipment zero emission, quite simply. And uh, what, what they see the parallel with motorsport is that the challenges are really tough. These are actually relatively very high value, small number of units that have a huge challenge, and that fits quite nicely with the motorsport get it done and innov innovation attitude. It's so interesting because, as you describe, the sort of extreme parameters that you're having to test and design for are quite similar. But most sport has this very glitzy and glamorous connotation. Mining, maybe less so. Was there a bit of a surprise when engineers were starting to be drawn onto those sorts of um, projects? So I think uh, I think over the course of WA's history, we've always done work in different spaces. We've done work in marine, we've done work in aerospace, we've done work in defence, and they all have a common theme, which is how do you can you make something more efficient? So it's always been about energy efficiency. And actually, from a team point of view, they quite like like different challenges and uh, some of these machines and pieces of equipment are so large that unless you see them you can't realize how large they are but to, to un most people say it can't be done and that is a really good challenge for our engineering team if somebody says it can't be made electric they will probably find a way to make it work <laughs> say so i will prove you wrong exactly yeah <laughs> We've come into the battery build facility where they are busy assembling cells into modules which then go into packs. And it's so cool because they're pretty cell agnostic. They can use pouch, prismatic, cylindrical, depending on the application. And they do so many different types of batteries, right through from Gen 3, Formula E cars, all the way to this, which is what we're really here to see because that is one of the big batteries that goes in the electric mining truck. battery module and inside those are loads and loads of cylindrical cells. Now there are 36 of those modules inside here and there are eight of these inside the 221 ton truck. That is a phenomenal amount of batteries. In fact, I'm told that is just shy of 100,000 cells, meaning the overall capacity is 1.4 megawatt hours. That is absolutely huge. In fact, I think that's probably about 25 electric vehicles. We're talking really, really big voltage. 
But the thing that's so interesting about all of this is that mining is so extreme. Until you've seen a mining truck, it's so difficult to just get a sense of the scale and the amount of power. So they've had to work incredibly hard to understand what the payload is, what the capacity needs to be, how these are used, how they're charged, the kind of conditions that they need to operate in. And so this isn't just a case of taking a load of cells, plonking them in a truck and putting them out into the wild. This has been a whole process to really, really vigorously understand what those criteria need to be. One of the things WAE is very well known for is providing all of the Gen 3 batteries for Formula E. A Formula E car seems vastly different from a 221 tonne truck. How have some of those, have there been any learnings that have been taken from race to the truck? There, there is actually a huge, huge amount in terms of uh, some of the fundamentals of, of the, the power and energy density re requirements. But I think actually more, you know, everybody talks Formula E, Actually, if you start looking at the Extreme E series that, that WAE also supports, and you look at effectively the, the environments those packs are being taken into, they're, they're very similar. They're going from Arctic to desert. If the shock loads that you see on those types of off-road vehicles are very, very similar, particularly when, um, when issues occur with drivers on, the, on those events, but it'd be that provides a, quite a similar when you start looking at the characteristics that you need in some of those cases. It's just a load of bigger batteries, but that's not the case at all. Why isn't it the case? What are some of the other things you have to consider when we're talking about things at that scale and in those kind of harsh environments? It's a, it's a very different environment. We've t the the, the am ambience you're operating in up to, up to 60 degrees, the um, power requirements, the shock and vibration that you will see potentially in, in different applications. It, it is very different, so we need to be looking at all those sorts of parameters, plus linking the weight in, into that because it is a, a capacity impact on the, on the truck. So there's, there's lots of external factors that are coming into our, uh, our engineering requirements that feed into, into it. But probably one of, the, one of the key things is around the vibration profiles that you see that it is very, very different between the sort of automotive type applications and the larger applications. A few more boulders and rocks, rocky surfaces perhaps that are going to provide those additional strain to those cells. So is that, does that mean that you have to create interesting structural components beyond sort of the just purely thinking about electronics? It, it is. You have a number of, of critical test cases for the vehicle. Yeah. Driving through a metre deep pothole is one of the extreme low cases that you see. So you then have to be looking early in the engineering process as to how the overall structure is operating and, and, and moving in that case and look at the, the stress levels that you, that you see. It's, that, that is something that you, you don't see. But then we have to then look from a safety perspective, how are those loads translated into the core of the battery and do we have any risks, concerns around, around those, those aspects? Because that's the consequence of, of those, those extreme events that we've got to be engineering against. When you look at a white box like this, it's difficult to imagine just kind of what the voltages that we're talking about. But then when you see the PPE that the team here need to wear when making it live and getting it into that high voltage mode, that's when you begin to understand that it is pretty serious. And of course, they do so much safety testing here to make sure that this is as safe as possible. So once again, fully charged, just really pulling out all the fashion stops. The prototype is running at the moment. Now, has there been any change to how the overall operations work? So for example, typically these trucks are working pretty much all day. This now needs to charge. Has there been any notable change to the operations? There, there will be a change in the number of, of trucks. You obviously the number of charges per day that you see on, on the truck is dependent on the haul routes it's operating on because that's down to the energy requirement. If you've got a very long, hard route out of a deep pit, the truck will charge, charge more per day and therefore the number of hours driving that you, or moving products that you will see will, will change. So there will be, will be impacts. There's a lot of optimization around that. And the time we, we spend charging the battery becomes a very important part of that, that productivity. So how do we deploy fast charge 
into these, these sorts of environments is, is critical for the mine operator to keep earning their revenue as a business. And how do you install that fast charging infrastructure in extreme, I mean, we're talking extremely remote places, these mines? So, so up, in the, up in the Pilbara, one of the, the goals of, of the Fortescue business and the mining part of the business as part of their decarbonisation is installation of a, of a huge amount of solar and wind and renewables. So that, that vision will deliver green, green power. That will need to be supported by battery electric storage to, to then be able to balance, balance the load. But the really important thing is, is then looking at how we fast charge that. So up in the, the Pilbara, we also have a prototype um, fast charger looking at, at charging the overall pack in, in under 30 minutes. So we'll be able to, to turn around a charge of the vehicle in, in 30 minutes with that charge. The team here aren't going to stop with just the prototype version of the Roadrunner project. And in fact, they're not even going to stop with just this facility here. And they're busy building a big battery facility up the road at Banbury, where there will be 400 megawatt hours of battery capacity ready to electrify all of Forescue's mining truck fleet. And in fact, they're not gonna just stop at mining trucks either. And the project that I am so excited to follow is something called the Infinity Train. And in this instance, this train is using regen braking thanks to the 34,000 tonnes of iron ore that it's carrying as it travels downhill from mine to port. Hugely complex uh, project, not least because that train is 2.8 kilometres long. It's been amazing to come here and to see the scale of the battery ambition happening right here in Oxfordshire. And it's also been amazing to see what happens when two worlds collide, the world of motorsport and the world of mining. And when you take some really talented engineers, some massive problems, you can prove that even the biggest of mountains can be moved. Let us know what you think in the comments. And if you have been, thanks for watching.